Florence Williams isn't fragile. She's taken on tough rivers by herself, and she knows where to go for the best breathtaking views. But when Williams realized one day that her 25-year marriage was ending, the emotions that hit her felt like unfamiliar territory. Disbelief, grief, loneliness. These are the hallmarks of a broken heart. In Heartbreak, a personal and scientific journey, Williams probes the pain that took over her mind, body, and soul as she struggled to understand why losing someone you love feels so bad. That's because feeling alone and rejected literally changes our cells and our immune systems. But Williams also discovered that heartbreak doesn't have to break us. In fact, if we can open ourselves to the beauty of the world around us, we can gain something new. Florence Williams, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Brenda. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Tell us where you're joining us from, too, because you are uh, you are on the move all the time. Uh, that's what you learn in, in reading Heartbreak. Exactly. <laughs> right. I, I do like being on the move. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. I'm based there, um, but I, I'm currently speaking to you from Boulder, Colorado, where I'm spending a week or two. Right. And you lived in Boulder, right? And, and raised, raised your yes. children for a while. Yes. Too, my, right? my heart is still largely in Colorado. <laughs> mm-hmm. Tell us how Heartbreak started for you. It started in a very personal place. Yes, it is a very personal story. That's what sort of launched my journey as a journalist writing this book as well. So um, I I met the man who would become my husband when I was 18. It was actually literally on my first day of college. Um, we dated for about seven years and then we got married. And um, we were married for 25 years. So um, literally my entire adult life, 32 years together. One evening I saw an email on his phone that he handed me um, that was basically professing his love to someone else. It was an emotional relationship, not a physical relationship, but there were very deep feelings there for someone who wasn't me. And I knew at that moment that, um, you know, my marriage was either going to look very different or it was over. And that was kind of, that was really the beginning of, um, you know, a journey that, that did lead to us separating um, shortly thereafter. Even just hearing you describe it and, and going back to the moments where you explained it in the book, I, it can just yeah. feel the physical agony of that moment when you realize yeah. your life is changing. Yeah, it was really a shock. It was a total shock. And um, I I did feel it physically. I felt like my stomach was in a different place. Um, And it never it didn't recover, (laughs) let's just say for a very long time. And and that's also partly what what led me to want to understand the connections between my emotions and my physical body. As I'm, I'm sure you probably asked me, you know, what kinds of things happened to me physically, but but there there were a string of of unfortunate illnesses and and other things that happened. Right, that becomes the basis for sort of understanding this really tragedy is what it feels like when it when it begins, especially for yourself and then for your readers who you communicate with. Exactly. You start this story uh, in the outdoors, which is such a huge integral part of your life on a river trip that becomes sort of a metaphor (laughs) for so many of the things you're experiencing at that time. Yes. And, you know, I had written a book before this one called The Nature Fix, in which I was really looking at the science behind why we feel healthier and happier when we're outside. I could really relate to that. Uh, And when I, when I moved to Washington, D.C., I felt this, you know, sort of big also change going on in my body and in my brain, kind of a stress response to this different environment. And so I was already primed to try to seek comfort and healing in nature. Uh, And that manifested itself in some both expected and also unexpected ways. So I do start the book there. uh, And then I take a step back into sort of more about what happened in more of the science that I'm investigating. Uh, And then I return to the 
to the river trip, um, which was a 30 day trip and that becomes kind of the heart of the book. One of the things that comes out too, as you're describing that is that you're doing something that you love, that you shared with your former husband, but you're in a totally different state than any other time maybe that you've done something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was used to being in the wilderness with him and I was used to feeling safe with him, that he would sort of protect me out there. He was really competent in outdoor skills. Uh, he was older, more experienced. And here it was like, okay, this is now gonna be my thing and I need to learn how to do it on my own. One of the early reviewers of Heartbreak uh, said something so beautiful that really sums, I feel like your memoir up so much is that this is about losing a marriage and finding another way of being. Is that how it started out or how it turned out? How did it begin for you? <laughs> yeah, I, it, did, it didn't married, start that did way. It, right? it started out feeling like I am completely adrift. I have no idea which way is up. I am existentially freaked out. So um, to lose a primary attachment like that uh, is to really feel like you're adrift. I didn't know you know, what was going to be next. I, I was really scared. And in fact, these are very normal human responses because as mammals, you know, we are a hyper social species and we're not really built to be alone at all, but especially not a sort of alone in the wilderness, which is, you know, where we evolved. And to be a human alone in the jungle meant that you were really in a state of threat because you were more likely to get eaten by a predator, more likely to get injured. Um, and so your body actually goes into a fight or flight state um, pretty clearly. And, and, I, and, and you feel that, you know, it, it feels like fear coursing through your body. Uh, you're sort of looking over your shoulder. You're not sure what's going to come hit you next. How did you begin to experience that physically? I um, had a lot of stress hormones, you know, coursing through my body. I was not sleeping very well at all. I lost 20 pounds that I didn't want to lose right off the bat. And, and that's actually really common in both men and women who go through divorce. My blood sugars got really whacked out. And um, some months after the split, I was diagnosed with uh, an autoimmune disease, um, which is type one diabetes, which is the one where your, um, your antibodies are actually attacking your own pancreas. Um, and so uh, I talked to one psychologist pretty early on and he said, you know, the story of divorce is a story of inflammation. And then I started working with a neurogeneticist at UCLA who had done a lot of research into specifically our white blood cells during times of social stress, um, for example, in states of loneliness. And what he was finding that was that our, our, gen our genetic markers really change and they change the way our immune cells fight threats in our environment, depending on whether we feel lonely or not. And so we decided to actually take samples of my own blood and analyze them at various time points after the split to see how my immune cells were changing and then if they were starting to recover as more time went by. So that was really interesting. He'd never worked with a journalist before who actually, you know, was going through a sort of very specific life event that might illustrate some of the science that he was doing. And I think that that work turned out to be really, really interesting for the book. You've always written about topics that are personally important to you. Your first book was Breasts. Yep. And that one started because I found out that there were toxic chemicals, industrial chemicals um, in my breast milk. Uh, I sent some of my breast milk to a lab in Germany for an article for the New York Times Magazine and came back with um, jet fuel ingredients, flame retardants in my breast milk, pesticides. So that launched this whole book on um, how our breasts are different in modern life and what that means for our health um, and our children's health. And then, as I mentioned, the second book is called The Nature Fix. And that was really driven by curiosity um, when I moved from the mountains of Colorado to the heart of Washington, DC. But this book was really a lot more personal. That's what I wanted to say. So you're used to picking topics that are important to you personally, but this went on a whole other level. And I wondered as a reader, did you imagine in the beginning that you would ever follow this journey through a memoir or was that the farthest thing? Where was your head at when you started this processing it as a writer? How did the book start to come out and become sort of a necessary part 
of, mm. of your healing and your ex and explaining this to yeah yeah certainly not right away i mean i was very much just consumed with you know experiencing what i was experiencing but as a writer and i'm sure you know you've heard from other writers that that this is one of the ways that we process you know difficult times in our lives is is we turn to writing about them um and i think it was nora efron who said everything is material um, but it, but I didn't really know I was going to have a sort of unique or interesting story worth telling, you know, that, that would sort of register and be helpful to other people until I really had experience and understood a little bit more about the physical effects of heartbreak. And I felt like that was a story that hadn't been told before. And I felt like it was a really important story, actually, because I think that we have a tendency to um, not appreciate how difficult heartbreak really is. I think we tend to think it's something that happens in our psyches, you know, that it's a big emotion. Um, but, but, you know, sometimes we get sort of overly dramatic about it and, you know, we just need to get over it. And it was only once I started talking to the psychologists and the geneticists, you know, who really study this, that um, I realized in the words of one, one scientist said to me, you know, heartbreak is one of the hidden landmines of human existence. And if you don't try to recover from it, it will have serious implications for your health. I thought, okay, wow, I need to tell that story. Yes. And it's the one landmine that you cannot avoid by any <laughs> other kind of behavior, right? I mean, you, you can't outsmart it. You can't outrun it. You can't outplan it. No, it's, it's just one of those things that happens to most of us, actually, <laughs> sooner or later. And it's not only romantic heartbreak. I mean, there are lots of ways we experience heartbreak. You know, there's bereavement after the death of someone we're attached to. There are the kinds of heartbreaks we suffer when we see our landscape of our home changing. There are the heartbreaks that many of us are experiencing during this pandemic, where we feel cut off from our communities. And then, of course, I also feel like there's a sort of perhaps unspoken heartbreak that many of us experience because we are just disconnected from nature and we're increasingly disconnected from our communities. One of the things I think that um, that you've, you've kind of touched on, too, is that um, heartbreak is one of those things that we almost feel embarrassed um, or like we don't have a right to be upset about it. Like it seems like it's almost presented to us as sort of self-pity. Yeah. And divorce, especially. I right. think there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of shame uh, associated with divorce. And I think um, it's, it, it's, it's worth pointing out, actually, that divorce is not nearly as common as it used to be. Um, I know a lot of us think, oh, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. But, but actually, that statistic isn't true anymore. That may have been true in about 1980. Um, but now, overall, it's 38%. And among college educated people who have been married for two decades, the divorce rate is only 15%. So for me, it felt like a very isolating experience. And for many of us, it does. I, I didn't have any close friends who had been through this. Um, and a lot of my close friends, I think, didn't really know quite what to make of it. Um, you know, I think there are some people who are in marriages who think it might be kind of like a contagious disease and don't necessarily, you know, want you hanging around if you're divorced. Right. And I think also um, some people who aren't going through it worry about, um, you know, mischaracterizing it, saying the wrong thing. Um, yes. But 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 that said, you know, you find out who your friends are. And for me, one of the most, I think, powerful and redemptive experiences of going through this is that my good friends really were there for me and really helped me, showered me with love, you know, tried to convince me that I was not worthless, that I, you know, was still worthy of love. And that was actually a really beautiful experience from this. Yes, I'm glad you bring that up because that was by far my favorite part of the book is those moments when you would go back to your friends. Um, and even the people that became your friends through too, some of the sources you spoke with were yeah, the, were the yeah. greatest source of comfort. But I loved when you went back to those sort of little intervals to say, okay, like, let's check with, uh, you, you know, you talk about your sister-in-law. Yeah, uh, she's, was, <laughs> she saved my life. Yes, exactly. And she's yeah. funny. Like, she's so funny. And and actually, I want to, I want to emphasize that, that a lot of this book is funny. <laughs> it's, it it's is. not all just like, 
woe is me. There are a lot of right. um, funny conversations, um, right. sort of bizarre, you know, things that happened. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, thank goodness, thank goodness for our friends. And, and they are one of the ultimate pathways to recovering from heartbreak, for sure. You recently uh, wrote an essay for Vogue that also builds on this and gives a snapshot of what you experienced on this journey. Uh, and it talks too about nature being the being the catalyst for so much for you. Yes. So um, just a couple of months after the separation, uh, you know, I, I just was like really not doing so well, just as I said, sort of, you know, feeling like I was spinning, um, you know, really trying very hard not to feel depressed because depression is pretty common after heartbreak. And fortunately, my friend Betsy said, let's all go on a vacation where we, and she's really athletic. So I sort of knew that I was going to be getting myself into something and I wasn't just going to be able to like lie down in a pile of blankets. So we took our kids and um, we uh, actually went on a really fun adventure to the Italian Alps for about a week. And we went rock climbing, we went mountain biking, we went hiking. And I found myself for the first time in months, actually grinning with joy um, while I was careening, you know, down some mountain on my mountain bike. And then we also did a pretty challenging, what they call a via ferrata, which is this iron cable that hangs off a mountain, <laughs> hangs off a cliff face. And you go with a guide and you strap yourself in. I mean, I'm not an expert rock climber at all, but um, it, it's kind of, it's, it's a very sort of beginner way to rock climb. But it's challenging and it feels kind of scary because you're really exposed. I mean, you look down and it's a thousand foot drop. And I felt this incredible sense of just strength hauling myself up this cliff face. And it made me feel like I am brave, like I do have some ability to pull myself up. You know, again, the metaphors of these outdoor adventures, I think, are really, really helpful. As a reader, it felt to me. Uh, that you were really trying to reclaim this love for yourself of nature because it had been such an integral part of your marriage and your family. And it felt like it was a journey of trying to, to sort of take it back to being yours. That's right. And to be fair, I mean, before I met my husband, my father took me into the wilderness often regularly. We did river trips together. So I did feel like it was a part of my core identity that pre-existed my partner. And uh, it was it's so important to go back to those early, you know, the, the pre-partner days. That's that's where you naturally look when you find yourself, you know, suddenly partnerless. It's like, well, who was I? Who was I before him? And, you know, I was only 18 before him. I, I wasn't fully baked yet, but I did want to go back and sort of access her and who she was. Because, you know, what happens when we enter a marriage um, is that we accommodate the other person and we do change and we are not necessarily just true to ourselves. We are sort of true to something else, which is this partnered culture. We co-create something together. And ideally, that's really a good thing. But sometimes you, you can lose yourself in the process. And so when it ends, you need to go back and you figure, it, it, again, it's a sort of wonderful opportunity to relearn who you are and what's important to you. And that was also, a, that was a really, um, it was, that was kind of a beautiful self-discovery phase. And I'm, I, you know, I'm glad I had it. As a writer, you've become really sort of an evangelist for for the healing powers and the importance of nature and our health and our well-being. You've written for Outside, National Geographic, tell us. I mean, you're, you're kind of always sort of exploring this in a micro way too. That's right. I've written for Outside Magazine for ages. I've loved doing that. And they let me write a lot about science, uh, which is really nice. Uh, National Geographic. I wrote a piece for them on the power of parks. Uh, again, looking at sort of how different brain scientists were measuring uh, how our brains behave when we're in nature. Um, I also do a lot of podcasting now and audio work, which I really enjoy. And actually for the Heartbreak book, we have made what we call an enhanced audio book. So it's sort of almost a hybrid between a podcast and an audio book. So we bring in a lot of actual tape that I recorded, you know, during the three years of reporting this book. Um, so it's, it's not just me speaking. It's also a lot of other voices. And I think it's really fun. 
it's interesting too, to think this started for you essentially on that day in 2017. So now we're almost like five years out from that. Um, and you're on the other side to some degree. Um, what's that like now to be able to, you're, you're talking about the past, but you're in a better place. People ask me, you know, was writing the book helpful? Um, and I think, I think it was to a degree because it gave me this sense of purpose and I was following my curiosity. I was engaging still the sort of my core identity as a journalist, as, as you lose so many other parts of your core identity, you know, that became really helpful. It got me up in the morning, got me out into the field and talking to people, but then the actual writing the book does sort of put you back in this place of, okay, I have to write this really painful scene and I have to access these painful feelings. It, you know, it sort of, it, it did keep me in the black box of heartbreak for a while, but then this great thing happened when I, when I turned the book in <laughs> and I hit send and it was done. I felt like I am done with heartbreak. Like I'm done, I'm done with it. It helped me feel like there was, um, you know, some sense of distance from it. That said, I also spend time writing in the book about how there is no like perfectly tidy closure at the end of heartbreak. Um, there will always be memories and thoughts and complicated feelings about my ex, about my marriage, about the life I used to have. And I think that's okay. You know, I, he will always be part of me and um, there will always be memories, you know, both hard ones and good ones. Um, so I think it's sort of a myth, you know, that there's always this perfect closure at the end. And in fact, I was very heartened when I talked to the awe researcher, you know, and she said, she said, you know, we find that the people who are most prone to experiencing awe are also people who don't always need closure. They don't always need to know how everything works out. Like a sense of mystery, a sense of uncertainty is, is kind of in some ways very wise path through life. You know, the Buddhists talk about this too. You can't be too attached to a certain outcome. You have to understand that everything is transient, including good feelings, you know, good feelings and bad feelings are going to come and go. The second paragraph, second to last paragraph, you start with a really simple sentence, but that really sums up um, so much of where you are at right now. And it says, I still believe in love. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I think that's, that's one of the central messages of the book that having gone through this painful experience, having gone through this heartbreak, um, I actually feel more capacity for love than I did before. So, you know, call it post-traumatic growth, you know, I don't know, call it what you will, but there's something about being sort of, you know, torn down to the studs, um, you know, exposed to all sorts of things. And, and then to come out of it feeling like my heart is more open now than it was before. I'm a better friend. I'm a better listener. I'm more present for the people I care about. Um, having gone through, you know, suffering myself, I feel like I can sort of handle hearing about it in others and being there for them. Um, so in some ways, you know, I, I do feel that love is more in my life now than it was before. So the foundation really of heartbreak is, is the, the healing power of nature and, and discovering that science and how it affects you. But as we all know, there are a lot of people that don't really have access to it, whether because of their own illnesses or location or just numerous things. How can, how can you relay this message to, to those people? Sure. I, you know, I would say kind of the, this, the central, um, one, one of the central concepts in the book is that beauty can be an antidote to heartbreak, but it doesn't have to be beauty through nature. So there are a lot of ways that we experience beauty. There are a lot of ways that we experience awe, you know, sometimes it may be listening to music or it may be looking at art or it may be um, entering a cathedral or finding it through religion. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to um, partake, you know, in, in, in whatever that is that creates a sense of um, beauty in your life and a sense of connection through awe. You know, this book really is breaking a lot of new ground. I mean, it's something we've always been told, yeah, go for a walk, you'll feel better, get some fresh air, you'll feel better. But yet you really, you dug into the science of this. Um, what's your hope in, in terms of the conversation going forward? You know, I would hope, um, as you say, that, that, that this will help us 
learn to feel more connected to nature or, or learn to appreciate nature and also the other things that that make us feel um, calm and connected. Um, but I also think a central message of this book is the power of other people to help heal us, that loneliness is an epidemic and a scourge of our modern times. Young people actually are experiencing it in very high levels right now. We need to work hard to try to get out of a lonely state. And it's not always easy because the, the sort of weird contradiction about loneliness or, or um, one of the weird ironies is that sometimes it makes us less likely to try to open our doors and, and call people because we feel maybe um, like our self-esteem is lower. Uh, and uh, so, so it's, but it's really important to try to do that. So if you know someone who's suffering with this, or if you are, uh, it's worth the effort to try to engage again in, in uh, being with people who, um, you know, make you feel good. And then finally, the third piece is that it's also really important to have a sense of purpose. And that one of the antidotes to loneliness is purpose, not just other people, but doing something that's important to you a way that you feel like you can contribute to the world or contribute to your family or make someone's life better. That's also going to actually be really good for your immune cells. Uh, and that's what the researchers have found that I talk about in this book. One of the things that really came across to me as a reader was the sense of gratitude. You just, um, I, I, it was just so obvious that you just, at the end of all of this, you just felt really grateful. Yeah, you know, when, when a, a life tragedy happens to you, I think it's, it's so destabilizing, partly because you don't know how you're going to get through it. Um, I didn't know, you know, if I was kind of a survivor or not. And I was so grateful to meet the people I met along the way, who shared with me what they learned and the wisdom that they had. Um, I learned from so many people, you know, they really opened their laboratories to me. They opened their hearts to me. My friends who opened their arms to me. Um, so much to be grateful for. And um, a lot of new gratitude at the end of this process. Yes. Florence Williams, thank you so much for speaking with us. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Brenda. It's been great to be here.